morning, Jerusalem. Is it well with your soul? As we enter into this new year, I want to encourage all of us to continue to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We've now made it to a new year. Still dealing with COVID, but we made it. Still facing challenges, but we made it. Still balancing life like a teeter-totter, but we made it. Not sure how or if we would make it, but thank God we made it. And the reason we made it was because of the faithfulness of a loving God who continually extends grace and mercy to all of us. So this morning, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 10. That's Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 10. And there we'll find these words written. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dressers of his vineyard, Behold these three years, I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father, we first of all say thank you for allowing us to see a new day in a new year. And as we come this morning, we pray, God, that you will continually guide us and keep us as only you can do. We praise you for your goodness and mercy and all that you have done for us to this present moment in our lives. And so now as we engage in your word, we pray, oh God, again, you give us ears to hear, hearts to believe, and wills to carry out your divine will in our lives. We'll be careful to give you the glory, the praise, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. This morning, I want to pose a question for us to consider as we embark upon this new year, and that question is, what will I do this year? What will I do this year? In Psalms 124, the psalmist declares these words. He says, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord, who hath not given us to as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. You know, the psalmist acknowledged that had it not been for the Lord on his side, his circumstances would have overwhelmed him. His enemies would have overtaken him, and, and life would have overcome him. But he recognized that his help came only from the Lord, and all praises belong to him. I'm sure that many of you tuned in this morning might have felt, uh, feel like the psalmist felt, knowing that it could have been the other way. Yet the Lord was faithful and provided all that you needed to make it. But the truth of the matter is this. Many individuals who the Lord gave multiple opportunities to bless his name and serve him, didn't do it. Yet God still provided and protected and even prospered them beyond measure, not because they were good, but because he was gracious. It is without question that 
we owe God a debt of gratitude that we can never pay him for what he's done for us. But we should at least seek to carry out what he asks of us as disciples of Christ. So I ask you to consider this morning, what will I do this year? I'm not asking what you didn't do last year or even why you didn't do it. But what will you do this year? And I base it on the premise of not what your intentions and your plans are, but what God's design is for you. The text this morning comes on the heels of Jesus teaching in the synagogue. And he is teaching, and as he's teaching, somebody in the crowd mentioned to him the awful uh, atrocity that Pilate did when he killed some Galileans, and then he mingled their blood with the sacrifices. Now, you need to understand that the mindset of the people in that day was that if some calamity or tragedy happened to someone, they believed there was evidence that that person had sinned a great sin. You know, if you remember, uh, that's what the people thought about the man who was uh, blind from birth in John chapter 9. And they asked Jesus, who sinned, him or his parents, that caused him to be in this condition? And, of course, Jesus' response to them was, neither. But he was born this way in order that the works of God might be made manifest in his life. And so Jesus has to straighten these individuals out. And then he asked them, well, do you think that those who Pilate killed were worse sinners than others? And that was, that's why this happened to them. You know, and then Jesus also references another tragedy and speaks to the people about on whom the Tower of Siloam fell. And he asks, were they worse sinners than others in Jerusalem? See, again, this is a common misconception that many people have, even Christians have it. And that is, if something bad happens to people, they believe it's a true sign that that person did something awful or did something sinful. People even uh, carry around unnecessary guilt and shame because they feel that God is getting them back or, or something that they did 5, 10, or 15 years ago or even last week. But the reality is, my brothers and sisters, God is not a vengeful God when it comes to dealing with his children. Yeah, God doesn't get his children back. Now, he will and he does discipline them when necessary. But God does not have to get them back or try to get even with them when they fall into sin and even disobedience. So when Jesus uh, responds to this statement, he needs to make sure that these people understand the importance of being who God had intended for them to be and then being consistent in their witness for him. Therefore, in like manner, we must make sure that as believers we do the same thing. And we must ask, and here's my first point, what should I have been doing? Okay. What should have I been doing? In the text, Jesus tells a parable of a fig tree that had been planted three years prior, but had failed to produce the expected fruit each of those three years. You know, I can imagine the disappointment that this man had with the tree not doing what it was supposed to do in light of the investment that he had made in it. There were some expectations that he had that did not materialize, and now he must make a decision on what he's going to do. Fruit trees are expected to bear fruit, not just look pretty, but bear fruit. They're not just to take up space in the garden or the orchard, but they're to bear fruit. Yet this fig tree had failed to do so for three years. As believers, we are to bear fruit. And if we're supposed to bear fruit, we must understand the kind of fruit we ought to be bearing. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God that worketh in you both the will and to do 
of his good pleasure. Colossians 1.10 says that ye might be, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, there are a myriad of scriptures that I could reference in regard to the kinds of fruit we should be bearing. And there are just as uh, many varieties of spiritual fruit manifestation. But the one thing that is in common in the above scriptures is that God has an expectation of those who belong to him to bear fruit. And that fruit is seen in the good works that he has ordained believers to do. Now, we equate doing good things with good works that please God. But that's really not the case. So we've got to ask ourselves, what is a good work biblically? Well, biblically, good works are not merely just good deeds. Biblically, good works encompass every aspect of our thinking and our conduct before God. Good works encompass not only caring for the poor, but also behaving uh, in a godly way toward your boss and your co-workers, right? Good works encompasses not only giving to the work of the ministry of the church, but also it means truly loving those who are in the church. Good works encompasses uh, not only distributing Bibles to those who have none, but also seeking yourself to understand, believe, and live out everything that is in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. See, every Christian needs to remember a vital fact about good work. Christ is the root, and good works are the fruit. Let me say that again. Christ is the root, and good works are the fruit. That's the proper order of things. See, we are not Christians because of our good works. We are Christians, first of all, because we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we must make sure that we are rooted and grounded in him. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And watch this. John chapter 15, verse 16 says, Jesus says this, he says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. See, God has ordained that as his disciples, we bring forth fruit. That means our witness leads to our work. Our witness is about Christ, and our work is for Christ. And in the final analysis, it all glorifies God the Father. So the fig tree should have been bearing figs, but it didn't. Many people should be bearing fruit, but they're not. So something has to change. But then there's another question that needs to be asked. And here's my second point. Why have I not done it? That's right. You got to ask myself, you know, why have I not bearing fruit? In other words, what has kept me from bearing fruit? Well, in the text, the owner of the tree, or the owner of the vineyard, says, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I found none. He said, Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? He wants to know. Why has the tree not done what it's supposed to do? Now, the text does not go into detail on why this is the case, but the reasons could be many. Bad seed, bad soil, bad support, and, and that means, you know, that whoever is responsible for its kelp keep has been slacking doing it. Maybe bad weather and much more. We don't know what the reason why it didn't bear fruit. See, some things we may be able to rule out, but rather than speculate, the bottom line is that there are some expectations that did not materialize. And so the owner comes to the conclusion, why cumbers it the ground? Or in other words, why let this unproductive tree remain? It's only taking up space and soil and some other tree might fare better. So let's just cut it down. Let's just get rid of it. When it comes to us as believers, we've got to be honest and ask ourselves, 
why have I not done what I'm supposed to do as it relates to bearing fruit for the Lord? Okay? And each believer must ask and answer that for his or herself. Is it bad seed? Or am I really who I say I am as a believer? Do I really know Christ? Uh, do I really possess the Holy Spirit? Am I saved? Or am I a Christian in name only? And I just know how to speak Christianese. And, and y'all do know what Christianese is, don't you? You know, it's just hallelujah. Like I said, praise the Lord. And, and won't he do it? And I'm too blessed to be sure. You know, all them kind of things we say that we sound, make us sound like we're Christian. See, you can talk the talk, but you can't walk the walk. Well, maybe you're not bearing fruit because of bad soil. In other words, are you planted somewhere you ain't going to ever produce? Like the company you might keep or the activities you engage in, the things that you saturate your mind with. How much time do you really spend with the Lord or even spend with godly people? Because it's interesting to me how we can love and spend a lot of time with Christians in church, but outside of church, we spend most time with folk who are not Christian. I don't know. Hey, but it's a fact. If what's above you is not in you, then you're going to become like what's around you. And so you got to be sure that you're not saturating your mind with stuff that's a bad influence on you. Well, the owner of the tree wanted to cut it down because he felt it was a waste of time, land, and effort. This had been going on for three years, and for the owner, enough was enough. Why had the tree not done what it was supposed to do? But then, more important, we got to ask, why have you not done what you're supposed to do as a believer in bearing fruit? What's, what's keeping you from bearing fruit? Bad seed, bad soil, maybe bad support, meaning not being connected with the body of Christ as you should. You know, see, see as Christians, we do not operate on an island. Or as uh, Al Jarreau was saying, we're in this love together. We got the kind that lasts forever. Y'all know that song, don't you? Listen, and, and watch this. The Bible will bag me up on that. For Jesus did say in John 13, 35, by this all men shall know that you're my disciples. Why? How? If you have love one for another. And then Paul shows us how that love and support works in the body. He tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 20 through 26, he says, but now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Name much more these members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. And then watch this, then he says, why? That there should be no schism or divisions in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. See, each member must realize that we need each other in order that the body can do what Christ has called us to do, and that is to bear fruit. Which it ever leads me to my last point, and that is, will I do it this year? I got to ask ourselves, will I do it this year? The owner says, just cut it down. Just, just get rid of it. It's not doing anything. Just cut the tree down. But the vine dresser says in the text, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and then dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, you can cut it down. He says, in other words, Lord, 
let me try one more time. Let me put a little more work into it. And when he says that, two things he says he wants to do. He says, let me dig about it and let me dung it. Okay? He wants to dig about it and he wants to dung it. Now, to dig about it, he means, let me see if I can get to the root of the problem. Let me go a little deeper into the situation. Maybe there are some roots underneath the ground that have worked their way around the roots of the fig tree that's preventing the nourishment that it needs to allow it to bear the fruit that you're looking for. Maybe it's some stones in the ground that won't allow the tree to get a solid footing in the soil. In other words, let me investigate a little bit more. But not only that, he says, not only do I just want to dig about it, but he also says, let me dung it. And you do know what dung is, don't you, okay? It's manure that is used to fertilize. He says, in other words, let me put a stronger fertilizer on it and see what will happen. Because there might be something in the dung that it might need. Here's my point. Maybe you need to go a little deeper in the word. Maybe there are some things that you are allowing to choke the word out of you. Okay, maybe it's a toxic relationship rooted out. Maybe it's some bad advice you receive from somebody rooted out. Maybe it's just the fact that you're not facing the truth about some things. If so, you got to root that thing out. See, whatever it is that you need to do to be fruitful, the question is, will you do it? But then also, maybe you need to be dunged to help you. Maybe there needs to be uh, allowed some strong situations to act as a fertilizer in your life that's going to help you grow. Now, understand as I'm, I'm making an application of the text, and you have to determine if you're going to be fruitful for the Lord and what that entails. Is it deeper digging, more dunging, or both? You got to figure that out. I think. That's just a little of both is the answer. And then I believe that Peter gives us the remedy to get there. Because in 2 Peter chapter uh, 2 uh, through 9, he says this. According as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great promises, precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And here's what he says you got to do. Besides this, giving all diligence, dig in some little more, add your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says, in other words, this is the digging and the dunging you need if you're going to bear fruit for the Lord. I believe in the text that the owner of the vineyard yielded to the request of the vine dresser and gave him another year to work. I, I, I really believe that. And you know what, my brothers and sisters, maybe you've not been as productive as you know you should have been in the light of the grace and the mercy and the multitude of other blessings that the Lord has given to you. And now here it is, a new year that God has allowed you to see. And again, the question is, what will you do this year? Will you bear fruit or will you continue to come to the ground by being unproductive? and wasteful. You know, I don't know what God has in store for us as a body in Christ this year, but I do believe that if we do what he requires of us, and that is to bear fruit, then God will be pleased. That's what Jesus' son did. He pleased his father. When he was baptized by John in the Jordan, the Bible says that the Spirit descended on him as a dove 
and a voice from heaven declared, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When he was transfigured on the mountain before Peter, James, and John, again, the heavens opened up and the voice cried out, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then uh, uh, when he got ready to go to Calvary to die for our sin, Isaiah had prophetically written in Isaiah 53.10, he says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out on Calvary, Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He performed a great work in order that we might be able to do good works. He died on the cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, but after three days and night, he arose all power and authority in his hand. He wants to know, what will you do this year? Will we bear fruit? Will we nourish ourselves in the fear and admonition of the Lord? Will the Lord be able to find fruit in the works that will bring him glory? Or will we, be, will we be barren like that fig tree and in danger of being cut down? My brothers and sisters, I pray that we are fruitful and productive this year to the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, the refrain of the song that we hear says, he wants it all. And that is true. God wants all of us, not part of us, not some of us, not half of us. He wants all our minds, our hearts, souls, strength, might, intentions, motives. Everything about us, God wants it. And he wants it not because he wants to do something different for us, but because he wants us to be productive. He wants to pour into us so that we can give back to him. I believe that just as that vine dresser was given another year to dig around and dung it, God's given us another opportunity. And we should take advantage of what God has allowed us to have in this new year. What will we do? Father, thank you. Thank you so much for giving us this privilege of seeing this year. Thank you for gracing us with mercy and forgiveness and a second chance to get it right. And God, I pray that if there's someone that does not know Christ as Lord and Savior, that's where they'll begin this year. Strengthen us, bless us, and keep us. We'll give you the glory, praise, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, as you go away, don't forget, as you go forgive somebody, because someone needs forgiveness now. And as the opportunity presents itself, I want you to share the love of Jesus Christ with those you come in contact with. Happy New Year. We'll see you next week in person worship.